we have some very special speakers. Um, so the first one is Garrett Allington. He is a graduate student in experimental pathology. So I saw that someone wanted to learn more about pathology. So we have a speaker for you. And he'll be talking to us about using modern technologies to treat rare diseases. Um, and then we have Shannon Leslie. Uh, she's a graduate student in neuroscience, and she's going to teach us about the proteins that are involved in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Garrett. So I saw in the chat some people wanted uh, some talks about diseases and pathology. Uh, so I think we can uh, we can cover that today. My name is Garrett. I'm a graduate student uh, in the Department of Pathology at uh, at Yale. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, genomics and telemedicine to discover and diagnose rare diseases in a genetic context. So first I just want to talk a little bit, a bit about who I am and how I got into science. Uh, so I'm from a rural area in California uh, that was relatively underserved as far as medicine goes, and I was aware of that because my mother was uh, uh, an emergency department nurse. Uh, so I kind of had that little bit of exposure into the world of, of medicine and seeing some of the challenges that face rural communities. Uh, I ended up going to New York University for undergrad where I studied biochemistry and also had a lot of uh, exposure to uh, other ideas like uh, genetics and computer science. And I, I further went and explored that uh, at Yale University, where I am now, and I'm doing a, a project that is looking at uh, using uh, telemedicine to look at the genetics uh, of idiopathic liver diseases, that meaning uh, liver diseases that we can't quite figure out what's causing them. So specifically, we're working with uh, telemedicine. So that's the idea of using uh, things like Zoom, what we're doing now, or other uh, technologies to communicate with people who are farther away so we can uh, reach people in communities that we would normally be able to reach. And obviously, uh, in the time of the pandemic, it actually has more uses even in local communities and just uh, uh, communicating with people who you wouldn't normally be able to, to see. So specifically, we're using telemedicine to look at rare diseases. So you can kind of think about that as uh, looking for the one zebra in the pack of horses, the one that just doesn't quite fit in, uh, and using that to deliver uh, diagnoses and serve rural communities uh, globally. So I just want to talk a little bit about uh, background. So can anybody in the chat tell me what the central dogma of molecular biology is? You might have heard this before in, in some of your science classes. All right, so the uh, central dogma of molecular biology is really the process of, of DNA to RNA to protein. So DNA transcribes to RNA, which gets translated to protein. And a really great way to think about this is to kind of think about it as a cookbook. So you have your grandma's nice cookbook full of all of your family recipes, right? And you don't want to destroy it or get it dirty or spill anything on it while you're cooking. So what you do is you make a copy of whatever single recipe that you wanted to cook, uh, and that would be like RNA. So this is like your disposable copy that you're just going to use to make what you want to get, which is the protein. And then after you have your RNA, you gather all of your ingredients, uh, and then you make your protein, which is the, in this case a cake, a nice finished product, which you can actually use. So you can think of DNA as the cookbook. You don't want to ruin the cookbook, so you make a copy of that, and that was what we call RNA. And then you can actually make what you want, which is uh, DNA. So DNA transcribes to RNA, which gets translated to protein. And that's essentially the central dogma, uh, what we call of, of molecular biology. And in that same way, you can think about uh, if you change the ingredients of a cake, you're gonna change what the actual cake looks like. So what this baker is looking at is, if he adds zero eggs, one eggs, two eggs, three eggs, or four eggs, the cake that comes out is going to be different. And in that same way, uh, if you were to change the base pairs of the DNA, so adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine are the base pairs which make up your DNA. If you were to change one of those, you could actually change the whole protein product that you were trying to make. And a really common example of this uh, is what we call uh, sickle cell anemia. 
So a change in just one base pair of the DNA can lead to uh, an abnormal uh, protein called hemoglobin, which is in your blood. And that can actually alter the shape of the cell, creating like these sickle shapes, which uh, can cause blocking, cause a lot of health problems. Uh, so that's just one example of what a genetic disease is. Can anybody in the chat name any other genetic diseases that you might have heard of? So yeah, I'm getting some good ones. Uh, hemophilia can be a genetic disease. There are definitely some genetic cancers. Down syndrome can be a genetic, yeah. So good, good job, guys. Uh, so I want to uh, just go over the sheer scale of how big uh, a genome or the whole of the genes in the body is. Uh, so there are 3 billion base pairs in the human genome. So 3 billion of those little A, T, G, C uh, linkages make up the human genome. Uh, so this group here actually printed the entirety of a human's genome, uh, and it was 130 books of 1,000 pages at four-point font. So you can actually see in the page here, it's just so small that you just can't even read it really and there's so much information packed into there and any single change can have impacts that we actually don't even know and actually over half of the genes uh in your body have at this point unknown function uh and if there were to be a mutation in one of those genes we actually don't know what would fully happen to that person so it's a huge open field of, of study that needs to be done in, in science and in medicine. So I specifically work on liver disease and pediatric liver disease, so liver disease in children. Uh, and this isn't too important, but all that you really need to know is that the liver has a ton of different functions. A lot of people kind of think about the liver as a sort of filter, but it has a ton of other uh, functions, things like uh, maintaining homeostasis, so keeping you uh, how you're supposed to be in terms of uh, your blood composition. It makes a bunch of different proteins, uh, just has a ton of different functions. So there are a, uh, a ton of different things that if your liver were to go wrong, could manifest itself throughout the body and things that you wouldn't necessarily think about. Uh, so we actually work with two communities, uh, one in rural Turkey and one in rural Pakistan here. Uh, and we look for uh, patients, young uh, patients who are experiencing uh, liver disease of unknown cause. So once we identify uh, a young patient with uh, unexplained liver disease, uh, we would take a blood sample from them, which gets uh, shipped to us, uh, where then we look through uh, the genome. So we sequence their whole genome, and then we look through it at the individual uh, base pair level, uh, to try to identify a single uh, mutation which could be causative of their disease. Then we reference that against the medical literature which exists to see, okay, has anybody described this before? Has anybody seen anything like this before? Uh, or is this something new entirely? Uh, and then we're able to give that information back to that, uh, that patient's uh, primary physician so that they can go along with treating. So I'd like to go with a little uh, case study about how this works uh, and how this can actually be applied. So uh, we had, uh, there was an eight month old boy in rural Turkey uh, who presented with uh, vomiting, upset stomach, poor liver function, hypolipidemia, and that just means uh, low hypo, lipid means fat, and emia means in the blood. So he had low levels of fat in his blood. And then elevated steatocrit, so elevated just means it's high, and steatocrit is the amount of fat that you excrete. So he is not having a lot of fat in his blood, and he is actually losing a lot of fat uh, in, his, in his bowel movements. Uh, so then when we actually met him at six years old, he had actually also developed uh, moderate intellectual disability, so he was not uh, quite developing intellectually as he should have, and septic fibrosis, which just means that his liver is sort of hardening, getting scar tissue. And unfortunately, his condition was deteriorating, so he was not exactly expected to survive to adulthood. Uh, so if we were to take this right now, can anybody in the chat guess out of these four things, what do you think is causing this boy's symptoms? Do you think it is uh, esophageal cancer, A, 
B, inability to digest certain foods, C, dietary intolerance, something like lactose intolerance, gluten intolerance, or D, malnourishment. All right, I think most of you guys are choosing B, inability to digest certain foods, and that's actually right. So again, the liver has a ton of functions, and one of them is actually to produce this substance called bile. And now bile goes from your liver uh, into your gallbladder, into your small intestine, where it actually breaks apart fats. So fats are one of the three major nutrients that you eat along with carbohydrates and proteins. Uh, so this boy, what we saw was we identified that he had a defect in a gene that we called ACOX2, which develops uh, this bile acid. Uh, and without the function of this gene, he was unable to produce the bile acid. And then the bile acid wasn't able to break apart the fat. So he just wasn't able to absorb the fat and it was passing through him, which really explained the low levels of fat in his blood because he wasn't absorbing any of the fat he was eating and the uh, high level of fat being excreted because it was just going right through his digestive tract. And then again, fat is super important to brain development. So that was like also explaining uh, his uh, moderate intellectual disability. So the nice thing about it was once we had actually discovered that individual problem, we had an understanding of what was causing this problem. It was very simple because he had a, a deficiency in the ability to produce cholic acid or a bile acid. Uh, so the uh, physician was able to just prescribe him uh, an oral, so saying something taken by the mouth, cholic acid supplement that he just takes every day. He's actually expected to live a normal life because of that. Uh, so it's a really cool sort of idea of uh, being able to understand at the individual level and then prescribe a treatment to that person that matches their exact disease. So this ties in to something called the Precision Medicine Initiative uh, or the PMI, and that's basically a, a, an initiative to identify and accelerate uh, development of uh, precision diagnostic techniques. So what we said, like looking at the patient at an individual level and trying to find uh, something that works for them, not just uh, broadly with people who share that same disease uh, type. So looking at them as an individual and trying to find something that works for them. And then also the bench to bedside gap. So I don't know if anybody has ever talked to you about this, but there's a huge problem between uh, bench work, so regular uh, basic science, and then the clinic in that a lot of the stuff that gets produced in, in the lab actually doesn't go to be uh, useful in the clinic. And then also a lot of the things that uh, people see in the clinic don't actually go uh, to uh, further research. So having these two work together in a really tight way uh, is a really cool uh, pathway to, uh, to advance not only the science, but also the clinical care. So they can kind of form uh, a symbiotic relationship, one where both are benefiting from each other. Uh, so that's basically it. I'm uh, open to take any questions about the about the uh, research or about the project or about science in general. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Garrett. Uh, so I think there have been a couple of questions in the chat. You talked about kind of liver and how that can affect to kind of is there a certain in like eating certain kinds of food can that lead to liver disease? So one was like Coke and Mentos or um, really old refrigerated pasta or things like that. So what's really cool about the liver as an organ is it actually regenerates uh, very quickly. So you can actually cause a lot of damage to it without uh, causing a lot of problems. Uh, it, you would usually uh, take a lot of, of damage to the liver. I'm seeing in the chat things like alcohol or drugs. These can damage the liver. But you need to do uh, a lot of it over a long period of time to cause real problems. Uh, so that's what's interesting about seeing uh, pediatrics, so kids with liver disease problems, because that's something that hopefully the kids aren't uh, taking alcohol or drugs, uh, so, or, and they certainly don't have the time to develop these over a long period of time of normal use. Uh, so we look at them 
and we think that there's a high probability that there could be a genetic cause to it. So that's partially why we're looking at uh, children who have liver problems. Um, and then another question, it was kind of related to, uh, like you said that you guys get kind of the um, blood work and then you uh, do a genetic analysis of it. Um, so can, can you have like, I guess the question is more like, can you have multiple kind of mutations that kind of lead to the liver disease or is it like one mutation leads to one kind of liver disease and the other way around? And so, so there are a ton of different uh, mutations that can cause it. Uh, and there are uh, honestly probably thousands that we just don't know about yet. As I talked about, there are about half of the genes that we have as humans. We just don't exactly know what they do. Um, but in terms of an individual person, all of these genes and the mutations tend to be rare. Uh, so it's very unlikely that one person would have two mutations. Uh, but there are certainly, you know, a lot of different mutations that can lead to a liver disease. Okay. And so just kind of going uh, based off of that, how many diseases do we not know of? Um, like, or have not heard of? Genetic I mean, diseases. Essentially thousands. Um, you have about 20,000 genes uh, in the genome and about 10,000 of those we really just have no idea what what they do or what a mutation in any one of those would happen, would cause to a person. So there are definitely uh, thousands of, as of right now, undiscovered uh, or undescribed diseases out there. Okay, and um, kind of, oh, and a question, um, this will be my last question related to uh, the case study that you showed. So um, do you guys usually travel to these places or are you just sent the um, samples? So that's part of the, the cool thing of this technology is we don't actually need to travel there. Uh, so we, we are just sent the uh, samples. It's just a dried blood sample that we are able to reconstitute and then, uh, and then sequence here at the lab uh, in Connecticut. So we're able to help these people uh, so far away without actually uh, without actually even needing to go there, which is uh, one of the benefits of, of this technology is you're able to to help people uh, very far away in a very uh, really scalable uh, way that's uh, relatively you know affordable for people to be able to to do that. So how how do you guys pick these places? Uh, so these places uh, are actually. Uh, relatively um, they have a lot of people who have uh, been living there for a very long period of time and haven't moved a lot so they're very uh, similar in terms of their genetic makeup mm -hmm. uh, and that can cause genetic diseases if you keep having uh, people with the same uh, genetic makeup uh, getting married and having kids, uh, and then those people uh, meet other people who are quite similar to them genetically. You have what's called recessive diseases, uh, which just means that if you have uh, multiple copies of that gene or that gene funk uh, defect, uh, then you could express a disease. But if you have one healthy copy, you'll be fine. Uh, so that just raises the chances of having uh, these genetic diseases. Uh, so that's uh, how we chose these populations. They have a uh, high rate of genetic diseases because they have uh, been living in the area and been living uh, in, uh, we, they're called endogamous communities. So people who uh, live together and uh, meet and marry people who are uh, similar to them. Awesome. So thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Welcome back from your discussion breakout rooms. I hope you all had a really good talk and were able to ask a lot of questions about um, precision medicine or specifics about liver diseases. Um, now we're going to stay in the realm of medical sciences, um, but push more to the like, molecular side of it. And Shannon is going to tell us about some of the proteins that are involved in Alzheimer's disease. It's going to be very exciting as well. 
Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction, Matt. Uh, as you said, my name is Shannon, and I'm a sixth year graduate student, which hopefully means that I am graduating soon. Um, and I am working on studying the proteins involved in Alzheimer's disease, so kind of the last step of the central dogma uh, that we talked about in the last talk. So first, uh, what is Alzheimer's disease? Has anyone heard of Alzheimer's disease before? Yeah? Some yes, some no's. Awesome. So some of you may already know, but I'm going to go over um, what it actually, what we define it as. Uh, so it's defined as a progressive neurodegenerative disease, which sounds like a lot of fancy words, um, but I thought we'd break it down. So first, what does progressive mean? Uh, so progressive means that once it gets started, it just keeps going um, and it goes in a pretty similar pattern uh, and once it's been started, you can't really change very much of that. Uh, so kind of like once you knock over one domino, all the other dominoes are gonna fall over. Um, so what that looks like for Alzheimer's disease is that in one area of the brain, you start to get the signs of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so it's like that first domino falling and then it spreads and encompasses kind of all of the brain, but it preferentially affects that first domino and kind of the next early dominoes the worst. Um, so that's what it means by progressing. It starts um, in one place and it spreads in a specific pattern um, as it, time goes on. And so that next word, neurodegenerative, is a really big word. Um, so it's easier if we break it up into parts. So what does neuro mean? Uh, so neuro means nerves, which like on your fingers, you have nerves so you can feel things, but also in your brain, you have nerves. So all of the cells in your brain are also called nerves. So this means it's a progressive disease that affects your nerves and it's degenerative, which means that it degenerates, um, which is the same or the opposite of generating something. So it's unmaking something. So it's unmaking your nerves, which means it's your nerves kind of falling apart, breaking apart or degrading. So what that looks like for Alzheimer's disease patients, here we have a healthy brain on the left and a patient with Alzheimer's disease on the right and you can see that there are a much larger holes. Uh, and that's because you're losing those nerves that usually fill up your brain. So your brain kind of normally looks like, I think it looks like spaghetti, where you have really plump fat noodles that are all stuck together um, and really fill up your whole brain. But in Alzheimer's disease, as you're losing nerves, those noodles kind of shrink. And so you get these bigger spaces. Um, so that's what happens in Alzheimer's disease and you can actually see it, in it when it's really late. And the last part is it's a disease. So it's a disease that falls under the category of dementia, uh, and it's actually the most common form of dementia. So dementias are a group of diseases that cause cognitive impairment. Uh, in Alzheimer's disease, this looks like a loss of memory, um, a difficulty thinking or problem solving. If anyone was here for the talk where uh, Veronica talked, we actually have a, one overlapping boss. and. So we study the same part of the brain, which is that prefrontal cortex right behind your forehead, um, which helped with the Simon game, if anyone played that take-home activity. Uh, and so Alzheimer's disease affects that part of the brain. So it's difficulty with working memory, which Veronica talked about, but also difficulty thinking and problem solving. And eventually there's a loss of communication. So that's what Alzheimer's disease is. But I thought I would tell you all why I study Alzheimer's disease. So as some people mentioned in the chat, um, they might have had family members with Alzheimer's disease. It is such a common disease that a lot of people might know someone who has it. Um, I actually knew multiple family members who had it. And if any of you have had the same experience, you might know that it's, it's a kind of confusing experience. So the first time I saw someone with Alzheimer's disease, I was pretty young. And when you're really young, you think adults have all of the answers, right? Um, so then when I was talking to my family members with the disease and they were forgetting things that I remembered, I thought that was really confusing. Um, and especially because you kind of look healthy, so you can't see external signs, um, but when talking to the patients, you can see that they have the disease. Um, so that was really confusing. And I thought I wanted to learn more and was hoping that I could find a way to help. But I didn't think that science was the way I could help. So when I was in elementary school, I don't know about all of you, but math wasn't really my thing. I didn't really like it. I didn't think I was very good at it. 
and math and science always seem to go together. So I was like, if I can't do math, I guess I can't do science. Um, and I liked writing. So I was like, maybe I can use writing to help study Alzheimer's disease. But then I got to high school uh, and I had some really great classes where I learned that you don't have to do math if you do science. Sometimes you can do math um, and there are great mathematicians who are also really good scientists, but you don't have to just do math. So I don't do math that often when I do my science. Uh, and science is a lot more about problem solving. So you're using all of the tools you have at your disposal and putting them together to try and problem solve. And so some people use math as a tool. I use more chemistry and biology as my tools. Um, and I use that to try to solve the problems that I come across in science. So even if you don't like math, you can still definitely find a way to do science and we still need you. And writing is also still really useful in science. So that got me thinking, how are scientists using their problem solving skills to help Alzheimer's disease? So I grew up in California, uh, like Garrett, but I grew up in a town called Irvine, which is actually kind of close to Disneyland, so that was pretty cool. Um, but it was also a town that had a university. So it had the University of California, Irvine, where they had this institute called the Institute for Memory Impairments and Neurological Disorders. Um, so that sounded really interesting. That sounds like somewhere where they would study Alzheimer's disease since it affects memory. And so I looked at what the scientists were doing at my local university uh, to better understand Alzheimer's disease. And so it turns out that they were studying proteins. So this is after you have your genes, you make your proteins, and then the proteins are kind of the workers in your cells. So they do all sorts of different jobs. Some of the proteins are building proteins, some of them are communication proteins, uh, some of them are like energy, or maybe you could think of them as like the chefs that prepare all the food to power the cell. So you've got all these different proteins that are working inside your cells to do these functions. Uh, and this is a picture of a neuron. So you've got all these proteins doing building all the different parts of these neurons. And you can see they're kind of confusing, right? They have branches, they have a long kind of cable part. So really important that you have all these different proteins working. Um, but unfortunately, proteins don't always work well. So uh, we can think of it kind of like a warehouse when all the proteins are organized. Uh, it's really quick and easy to understand which proteins you need and which proteins need to go where to do their jobs. But things are not always so organized. So things start to fall apart. They start to clump. They maybe get in the way of each other. And then uh, it becomes much harder for proteins to do their jobs. So this seems to be what's happening in some cases in Alzheimer's disease. So there are two main markers that we look for in brains to tell whether someone had Alzheimer's disease. And there are actually two different types of protein clumps, one outside of the cells that we call amyloid plaques and one inside of the cells called neurofibrillary tangles. So it seemed to me like proteins were a really good way to study Alzheimer's disease. Um, and I think proteins are pretty cool given that they're doing all those different things. So I guess I thought they were really cool. So I went to college um, a few hours north of where I grew up uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, where I majored in molecular and cell biology. I also did some fun things while you're at college. So uh, classes are really fun, but there's also football games and all sorts of different um, friends to make that can teach you a lot of things. So college was really a great experience where I learned a lot more. Uh, and I also did some research while I was in college. So I went to the University of California, San Francisco, where I studied proteins involved in trash handling. So like I said, proteins do all sorts of different jobs. And one of the jobs they do is clean up the trash uh, in the cell, make sure it stays clean and tidy. Uh, but this was in a different type of dementia. So I thought it was really cool, but I didn't really want to keep doing that work. So that's why I came to Yale. Yale has um, something called the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. So it's a lot of different scientists from all different disciplines coming together to study Alzheimer's disease. So this sounds really great. Um, and I wanted to study proteins in Alzheimer's disease. And there's a lab here that was doing just that. So I drove from my hometown all the way across the country uh, to come here. And now that I'm here, what I'm working on is making a better protein test for Alzheimer's disease. So what are some things we might need in a test? How could we get some of these proteins to study Alzheimer's disease? What might we be able to test? We need some patients, yep, that's a really good idea. 
How could we find the proteins? Where might they be? In the brain, yep, that's a good point. All over the body, yep, in the blood, yeah. So those are really excellent uh, points. So the brain would be ideal, but we can't get into the brain very easily. We can get blood, a lot of people do blood tests. Um, so our way to get the protein, um, one challenge is that there's a wall between um, the blood and the brain. So you do have blood vessels that go into your brain, but there's still like kind of a, a little like glove that goes around all of your nerves. Uh, and so this builds a barrier in between your blood and your brain. Uh, and this is really important sometimes because when you get something like a common flu, you don't want that to affect your brain, right? So this wall keeps things like the common flu out of your brain. But it also means that the proteins that we're looking for in the brain don't really easily get to the blood. Uh, so that can be really difficult. So what we use instead is something called cerebrospinal fluid, um, which is also a big word. We just call it CSF, so we don't have to say all that all the time. Um, and it's a fluid kind of like the blood, but encased in that little glove compartment. So it's closer to the brain. It gets kind of all the waste and nutrients, um, and it has better contact with the brain. So we can still use this CSF to make our protein test. It's a little bit harder to get than it is to get blood, but it's a lot closer to the brain. So we think it might be an easier way to see the proteins that are happening, or the proteins that are changing with Alzheimer's disease. So what are some things about this test that we might want? What are like qualities in this test so that we make sure we're diagnosing the patients correctly? Um, do we want it to be cheap, um, maybe easy? What are some other things we might want to make sure that this test has? that it functions, yeah, that's definitely important. If it doesn't work very often, that would be a problem. Healthy, accurate, yep, exactly. Money, yeah, we need to make sure that it's affordable for people, accessible, yep, that the tools we can do, um, that the tools that we have at our disposal, we can get to as many hospitals as possible. Yeah, those are all really good points. It's easy, yeah. Yeah, so we want it to be pretty fast and easy so that we can run it on patients while they're in the hospital pretty quickly. We wanna make sure that it gives the same results all the time. So we don't want one day a patient to be tested positive and one day they're negative. Um, that wouldn't be very useful. And we wanna make sure that it can detect really small changes. So um, the amount of changes in proteins, you don't have a ton of proteins. So we wanna make sure that we can detect really small changes. So you guys all have really good ideas, uh, and this is really what we talk about in our lab meetings, so you're already ready to be scientists. So this is uh, where I'm at with the test right now. We've tested hundreds, hundreds of proteins, so this is actually like two to three hundred proteins that we tested in six different patients. So each of these numbers represents a different patient, and each of the dots represents an individual protein. And so the um, y-axis is how different they are between different tests. So what are some things you notice? Are some of the proteins really different? Yeah. Yeah, so some of the proteins are really, really different. Yeah, so they're over 100% different. Uh, so that's not really reliable, right? But some of them look really similar. So there are some you can see at the bottom, um, and actually that bar is the average. So the average is actually pretty low, but we have some that are really, really, really different. So we wanna make sure that we're not using those tests because that'll look different every time we test it. So what I'm doing now is working with a team of scientists. So we always work as a team, because uh, I don't have all the answers to make this test better, but um, a lot of other people have really good ideas. So we're working as a team to try to make this test more accurate or pick the proteins that are the most accurate so that we can use those to see if they change between healthy patients and Alzheimer's disease patients. And so I just want to thank you all um, and also my lab and advisors. So as I said, it, we always work with a lot of other people. Um, also your friends and mentors are really helpful for you to have fun outside of science. And also your life outside of science is really important for your ability to do science. 
Um, and all of this research is funded by the National Institutes of Health and Gruber. And the picture at the bottom is my dog who's named after a neuroscientist. So I thought he would be a good note to end on. Thanks so much, Shannon. That was such a great talk. And also, I, I love looking at your dog. I'm glad you ended with on that note. <laughs> He's pretty cute. <laughs> yes, very cute dog. Um, I have a couple questions for you. Um, I think the first question I'm going to ask, since we just talked about it, would you mind going back to um, the last slide with your data? And could you explain how we, how we read this graph? Like, why, yeah. why are some of the dots spaced? And what does the different size boxes mean? Yeah, that's a really, a really good point. And it's kind of a tricky graph. So we have six patients, so each color is a different patient. Um, and then within each patient, we tested their, their CSF a couple of times. So we ran our same test multiple times to see how reliable it was. And what I'm plotting is how similar the results are between each test. So if the result was exactly the same each time, it would be at zero. Unfortunately, nothing is at zero. Um, but we have some that change by just like 10% difference. So maybe that's something we can account for. But then those dots that are way outside are what we call outliers. So they're outside the average range of this test um, and they're changing by way too much. So we wouldn't be able to use those, um, those proteins in our test really at all. Thanks for explaining. Um, that really clears it up. I was even a little confused as to, I mean, it's a pretty difficult graph. Um, yeah. Also a good reason to have science illustrators, which we talked about last week. They could help me plot <laughs> all this different information. Yeah. Okay, and then we also have a couple questions just about al Alzheimer's in general. Um, one um, question we got a lot was about the age. A lot of the people that we know that have Alzheimer's tend to be older. C can children get Alzheimer's or babies? And how is the age related to the disease? That's a, a really good question. And actually one of my other projects is looking at why um, older patients do get Alzheimer's disease more often. Um, and unfortunately we don't really know, um, but most people who get Alzheimer's disease are over the age of 65. Um, so it does really mostly affect older people. It can affect younger people, but by younger, we mean maybe like 40 or 50. Um, so kids and um, children, they don't really get Alzheimer's disease. Um, there are some other neurodegenerative diseases, but not really Alzheimer's disease. All right, thanks um, for that answer. Um, and then another common question we got was uh, a little bit about the cure for Alzheimer's. I feel like a lot of us know that Alzheimer's can't be cured, but are there ways of treating Alzheimer's? And what's the current um, update on that? That's a, a really good question and a really active area of research. So they are testing drugs to treat Alzheimer's disease now. Um, there haven't been any diseases that we, or any treatments that we call disease modifying, which means they don't stop the disease or prevent it from progressing or make it better. But we do have some drugs for treatment of symptoms. Um, so some of the memory symptoms, you might be able to get help for a little while during that disease process. So patients might be prescribed something for that period, but unfortunately nothing yet to stop or um, make it better, which would really be the ultimate goal. Uh, but there are a lot of diseases being tested right now. So maybe, maybe soon, hopefully. All right, and then one last question. Um, what is the percent chance of someone getting Alzheimer's? So like, where does that likelihood of getting Alzheimer's come from? That is also a good question. It depends on how old you are. Um, so the statistic I know the best is that once you're 80 years old, about one in three people will have Alzheimer's disease. So that's really, really common. Um, but before that, um, it's not quite so, so common, um, but it is the most common form of dementia and about 15 million people are expected to have it by 2050. So it is a really common disease. Well, it's really great that so many people are working really hard to hopefully find answers for it then. Um, yeah, thanks so much um, for sharing those answers with us, Shannon. Um, any other questions, please place them in the chat and um, Shannon will answer them afterwards. Thanks.
we're back here at Exploring Science with uh, Garrett, who first presented on uh, the genetics of liver disease, and Shannon, who presented second about Alzheimer's. Um, so first, I'll be asking Garrett a few questions um, that were left over that we didn't get to address during the Q&A immediately after his talk. Um, so the first set of questions has to do with the liver and liver disease. Um, so say, for example, somebody has prescription medication that is known to uh, possibly impact the liver. Um, like, how does that possibly happen? And if your liver completely stops working, what is it? Can you die? Or like, what does that actually lead to in terms of, you know, the patient's health? Yeah, so those are some really good questions. Uh, for the first bit about prescription medication, uh, a lot of them actually get processed through the liver uh, and can actually damage the liver uh, while they're being processed. Uh, usually, uh, there's a, uh, a limit to how much uh, doctors will, uh, will let you take, uh, and they'll prescribe a dosage which will not cause a lot of harm to the liver. Uh, even if it does cause a little bit, the liver is actually really able to regenerate quite well, so it can handle that damage uh, very well. Uh, and then there's uh, this massive, massive uh, structure uh, in place to get a drug approved for prescription use. So you go through a lot of preclinical trials on things like mice, on things like uh, monkeys, before you get to uh, clinical trials in humans. And uh, there are really three main phases to that where it keeps getting ramped up and more uh, restrictive on what gets passed. So by the time drugs actually get to the prescription level, you can be pretty certain that if you take them as described, they'll be very safe for your health. Uh, as to the second part of the question about what happens if your liver really stops functioning well, uh, that leads to a number of problems because as we talked about, the liver is very responsible for a number of different functions throughout the body. Uh, I believe it's in the several hundred range of different functions. Uh, so there's a lot that can go wrong. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, yes, you can definitely die from uh, having uh, lack of liver function through through a number of different, different means. So, but. Okay. Well, and, you know, hypothetical situation, um, if you end up with a liver disease, um, are, there, are there types of liver disease other than cancer that could spread to the rest of your body? Um, and if so, how does it do that? So there are... Uh... I'm not an expert on all the different diseases of the liver. Uh, I'm not immediately aware of anything that metastasizes quite like cancer does, uh, infections maybe. Um, but in terms of whole body health, if you do have uh, problems in the liver, uh, like what we talked about with the, the boy in the, uh, the case study who had uh, problems absorbing fat, that can hurt other areas of the body. So in his case, he was unable to absorb fat and that was causing problems with his brain because the brain is so reliant on fat for growth and development. Uh, so there are certainly ways that impacting the liver can impact other areas of the body. Uh, but I, I can't think off the top of my head of any uh, other diseases that work quite in the same way as cancer does. Okay, so then it's more that, you know, if the liver starts having problems, it can affect like cell processes and other types of organs yeah, in the body. Exactly. Okay. So, a lot of the different organs and organ systems really do work together. So if you were to take one out, uh, that would cause a lot of problems for other things. It's like if you had a soccer team and you took the goalie out, the defense is going to be a little bit uh, less effective then, even though, you know, defense and goalie aren't the same thing. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Um, so along that line, um, you know, we were talking, or you were talking about um, in your presentation about how some of these liver problems can be detected through the blood. Um, so like the low fat levels in the blood. So are there other ways that liver problems can be detected other than through the blood? Um, and in the blood, what is it, you know, what are some other things that you might look for in the blood as well? Sure, yeah. So uh, 
in, in terms of uh, the diagnosis that they do in the clinic, uh, they will look for a lot of different things. So things like the composition of your blood in terms of the nutrients that are moving around in there, sugars, fats, et cetera. Uh, they'll look at um, the composition of you know, what you're excreting, like we talked about, how we had elevated steatocrit, so elevated fats leaving the body through that sense. Uh, but in terms of what we do uh, on the more genomic side of things, Oh, we were using the blood to sequence the DNA, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the blood. So we can take, uh, we've done cheek swabs before, we've done a lot of different things, just anything that we can use to isolate DNA, which is kind of like your unique fingerprint that we talked about, that is uh, your recipe book to make those proteins. Uh, and then we can see uh, through that. So there are definitely uh, different ways to get that DNA. And then another thing to think about uh, is, most diseases of the liver aren't actually genetic. Most of them are actually caused by things like damage due to alcohol, drugs, other toxins like that, um, or they're uh, just problems that, that crop up otherwise. Uh, so it's relatively a small portion of diseases of the liver that are genetic. That's why we, are, we call, classify them as rare genetic disorders. Um, and so certainly not all diseases can be detected via genetics or via the blood. Awesome. Um, okay, so then kind of on that topic of genetics and these rare diseases, rare liver diseases that have the genetic component, um, one of the questions that came up in my discussion session was um, whether or not genetic engineering can be used as a form of future me medicine or way of solving genetic problems. Sure. So uh, for those who aren't aware, genetic engineering is really uh, using the tools that we have available now in terms of molecular biology to sort of edit and move uh, your genes in ways that would be advantageous to you. Uh, so we use them sometimes in, in farming, for example, to make uh, crops that are bigger and have uh, more yield of food. Uh, in terms of humans, people have for a long time been thinking about using genetic engineering to try to solve some of the genetic diseases that we talk about. Uh, there's a lot of problems with that, though, because it isn't like, you know, altering corn where you just make more kernels per cob. You're actually altering a person uh, in that sense. And there is a lot of questionable uh, ethics that go along with doing that. Um, there's a new technology, relatively new, called CRISPR, uh, which was actually used recently uh, in the last few years uh, on people and caused a a very big uh, ethical dilemma for the scientific community uh, about what should happen. Uh, and I believe two twins were, uh, were born uh, with CRISPR mutations and it was a massive breach uh, in terms of ethical standards for the scientific community and something that we still are dealing with. So I think uh, in, the, in the context of using genetic engineering on humans to solve things like genetic diseases, we're still a long ways off. Um, from that being something that's normal. And that's just because we don't have the highest level of understanding. It's like what we talked about with prescription drugs. We need to be sure that they're safe before we put them uh, for use in humans. Uh, so that would be sort of the roadblock that's preventing us from, from doing that in people. We want to make sure that it's really safe. Right. And to clarify for the audience, CRISPR is a molecular tool that goes in and creates cuts in DNA. Um, there have been advances with this technology to try and make it more specific and more safe so that it's only affecting the parts of DNA and only the places that we want. But as you could imagine, you know, even if you have a case where it targets the same place and the same type of cell 99.99% of the time, if you apply this to a large group of people, that 0.01% actually leads to pretty big numbers. So, um, yeah. I agree with everything that you brought up with this last question, and uh, thank you for answering our questions. Um, do you have anything else that you want to leave with our Exploring Science community? Um, I would just keep an open mind. Um, I definitely didn't think uh, when I was, certainly not in middle school, but even uh, into high school and into college that, uh, that I would be uh, looking at genetics and genomics in this sense. So. Uh, I would just say, you know, keep an open mind and uh, 
just follow what you're interested in. And yeah, it's, it's really fun doing, uh, doing science every day. You just get to explore what you're interested in, solve problems and work with people to make the world a better place. So. Awesome. Thank you so much, Garrett. And I'll throw it over to Rick. Thanks, Garrett. Uh, so not only was Garrett's talk and his answer to these questions really fascinating, but um, I think it was a great, um, a great analogy about the soccer player goalie because I was a goalie in high school and I think that my team suffered greatly whenever I wasn't there, um, or at least I like to think so. Um, but also uh, another tie to, to a previous life of mine, I used to study the liver. And whenever I started my undergraduate thesis, I said that the liver is really important and you can't liver without it. Uh, so I am a little disappointed you didn't use that opportunity, Garrett, to make an awesome joke for the kids, but next time. Uh, yeah, so anyways, uh, as much as I love the liver, uh, neuroscience really has my heart. And Shannon talked about one of the coolest parts about neuroscience, which is trying to help people who have neurodegenerative disorders or um, whenever their brain starts to f break down in certain ways. Um, and so Shannon, uh, so one of the questions that came up a lot uh, because you mentioned uh, how it, Alzheimer's might run in your family uh, is basically, can you be tested for like an Alzheimer's gene, especially if one of your relatives have it, or how does that work? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, and something my family asks me all the time, because as you mentioned, I did have quite a few family members with the disease. Uh, and it's a little complicated. So most of the cases are not inherited. We call them sporadic. So we don't know exactly why you got the disease. Um, so people without those genetics might still have risk factors. So maybe you have a gene that increases your risk a little bit for getting the disease, but it's not going to guarantee it. So even if you have that risk, you might never get the disease. Um, but then there is a smaller subset that we call familial Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so these people have genes where they will definitely get the disease. Um, so they're called dominantly inherited, which means if you have one copy, um, you will get the disease. Um, and so we know what some of those genes are. And if you have that in your family, um, you might get tested, but it's kind of up to you um, and your doctor. So doctors will be the ones who run these sorts of tests um, and you can be tested for the risk factors and you can be tested for the dominantly inherited forms. Um, but that's kind of up to individual families what they want to do. Um, since we don't really have treatments, it's kind of hard, um, you know, it depends on what you want to know. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, with the um, popularity of genetic testing, a lot of people think that they can just sort of figure out whatever's going to happen to them just by taking a, a 23andMe test or something, but that's not necessarily exactly how it works. Interesting. Yeah. So um, if that's the case, then, so how do you have any sense of a way to explain like how someone might get Alzheimer's disease? Does it just happen when you get old or uh, can you expand on that a little bit? That is an excellent question, and I really wish I had the answer. Um, <laughs> so there are definitely some uh, theories or hypotheses. So um, theories are a bunch of hypotheses together um, that make a, a larger theory to explain Alzheimer's disease. Um, and one of the main ones is uh, amyloid. So those the clumps that are outside of the cells that I talked about are made up of something called a protein called amyloid. And so some people think that once that starts to clump, that's really what gives you Alzheimer's disease. And it's those clumps that kind of drive everything else. Um, but not everybody agrees with that. And actually my lab kind of focuses on some other mechanisms that might be at play. Um, so we've looked at the immune system um, and your brain kind of has its own immune system. I mentioned that wall. So the um, immune system in the rest of your body that's fighting off that flu, um, it's keeping it from getting into the brain, but then your brain still needs to have some protection. So it has its own kind of resident immune cells. Um, so maybe something happens with that as you get older um, and can either increase the risk or maybe drive some sort of the pathology. Um, unfortunately, that's not a great answer. We don't really know, um, but definitely something we're looking into. So a big part of my thesis is looking at what happens with your brain as it age, because why is an old brain so much more likely to get this than a young brain? Um, so we still have lots to learn. I see. So that was sort of, um, that was actually the last part of your answer was sort of my question about like, why does, does it just happen to old people more because they have more of a time for it to happen, like more of a chance? Mm -hmm. Or is there any ideas about that? Yeah, that's uh, an excellent <laughs> question as well. These are all really good questions and they should come to my lab meeting. They can give me ideas for new experiments. <laughs> um, 
we don't really know. Uh, so we're still learning about what happens to your brain as it gets older. Um, it is really tricky that your brain is separated, right? So we can't get a blood test and be like, here's what changed in your brain. Um, and we can't really see your brain over different periods of time. So we kind of, if we want to look at your brain, some uh, people are really generous and donate their tissue after they pass away, and then we can look at your brain. But then we only know what happened when it was old. So it's really hard to know what's changing. Um, so as we develop new tools, we can look at that. Um, maybe using some other models, we can start to study that. Uh, but that's definitely something we're looking at a lot. I see. So it sounds like some of the students who ask these really awesome questions should definitely keep stay interested yeah. because they need a lot of people. Um, we they, we all need a lot of people to ask these good questions and come up with cool ideas. Exactly. Yeah, and, and that's kind of the hardest part, right? Is I think we've probably all been in lab meetings where we just can't come up with new ideas for new experiments. So we definitely need more people to join us and ask these questions because they're really helpful. Exactly. Yeah, sometimes it takes that new person with a fresh set of eyes to make you think about something a little bit differently, especially when their experiences are varied or from different backgrounds. That yeah, makes sense. Exactly. So to end on a more a slightly uh, more positive note, uh, there was a lot of interest in the chat uh, around your dog. Uh, so could you tell us a little bit about uh, his name? Because I know it relates to neuroscience somehow. Yeah, so um, my dog's name is Huxley. Um, I named him that because of a, a model of a circuit. So they're like circuits like in your computer um, and they can also be used to represent things in your brain. So your cells fire just like um, the circuits in your computer use electricity the cells in your brain do the same thing. So um, two scientists called Hodgkin and Huxley made a circuit model of a neuron. Um, and they did this before we even knew that there were proteins. So um, we didn't know that there were proteins in the cell that were making this electricity. So I love proteins, but they figured all of this out before we even knew that there were proteins. Um, and they got it really, really accurate. Um, so they were able to use math, which is not my thing, but I, I appreciate people that can do a lot of math. Um, so they used mathematical models to make this um, circuit. And I just thought it was super cool that they knew all of this before they even knew that proteins were the ones doing it. So then I named him Huxley. I see. So just no love for Hodgkin or is that going to be your next, uh, your next mm. dog? I'm only allowed one dog in this apartment. Otherwise, it would be overrun with lots of puppies. <laughs> I understand. Well, that makes sense. Well, it, it's nice that you, uh, you're you able to sort of give your, your animal a really nice name, as something you liked a lot. My name is, my cat's name is Kitty, uh, so I'm not <laughs> as, uh, as you know, imaginative in that way. But great. Do you have any uh, sort of takeaways that you, you want the students to think about? Um, I think just like ask questions. I mean, they ask such great questions. Um, and scientists love to talk about their science. So I just reached out to scientists in my local university and ask them what they were studying because I had no idea. Um, and really they just love to talk more about what they do. So whatever you're interested in, even if it's not science, um, we need artists, we need writers, we need people in all of these different fields to come help us with science. Um, so just reach out and ask questions and people really love to answer them. So don't worry about that. Awesome. Well, thanks a ton, Shannon and Garrett. We really appreciated your time and learning about your science and, uh, and also answering these follow-up questions. Thanks. So we'll see everyone in a couple of weeks. Thanks a lot.